Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about edema. Edema is one of the commonest symptoms that you would see in a hospitalized patient and it is essential to understand its pathophysiology so that you can figure out the correct etiology. My goal in this lecture and in subsequent one is to help you figure out underlying pathophysiology behind any fluid accumulation in human body and try to figure out how to manage it. Understand that edema does not become clinically apparent unless the interstitial volume has increased by 2 to 3 liters. And this is because the interstitium can easily accommodate several liters of fluid. By the time you start seeing edema symptoms, you are already up by 10% of the body weight. So what causes fluids in the capillaries to leak out? And this happens because these capillaries are inherently leaky and the fluid escapes from intercellular clefts. If you remember your capillary anatomy, the, the space between two cells is your intercellular cleft and mostly they have tight junction, but there are areas with large gaps in them. And these are slit pores and they can be 10 to 20 nanometers wide. And this is the area where most of the fluid leaks out from. The amount of fluid that would leak out would depend upon the hydrostatic pressure difference between capillaries and the interstitial space. This pressure is generated by your mean arterial pressure. However, we have a pre-capillary sphincter at the beginning that regulates the capillary pressure. On the venous side, however, this system is unregulated. So you would commonly see most reasons for edema formation are problem with the venous side. Second is your oncotic pressure gradient, which depends upon the concentration of the plasma proteins versus interstitial space. Whatever extra fluid that has leaked out is returned to a circulatory system via lymphatics. So there are only four reasons why you can develop edema. If you have got problem with permeability or leakiness, changes in hydrostatic pressure, changes in oncotic pressure, and problems with lymphatics. So to put it in a mathematical formula, the net filtration is equal to permeability of the capillary, and this constant is your hydraulic permeability coefficient, which increases as the pressure applied to the capillaries increase, multiplied by surface area and multiplied by the pressure gradient. The pressure gradient has got two components. First is your hydrostatic pressure gradient. That's the difference between capillary pressure and the interstitial pressure. And second is your oncotic pressure gradient. That's your difference between plasma oncotic pressure and interstitial pressure. Sigma here is a Stewart-Mens reflection coefficient of the protein. If your reflection coefficient is zero, that means that protein is completely permeable. And if it is one, it is completely impermeable. Therefore, the net interstitial fluid that accumulates will depend upon the amount of fluid that is filtered from capillaries minus that removed by the lymphatics. If the amount of fluid coming from capillaries is more than what your lymphatics can remove, this will result in edema formation. The hydrostatic pressure difference decreases as you move from arterial to venous side of the capillary bed. This capillary pressure will depend upon three things. First is amount of the fluid that has moved out of the capillaries. Second resistance of the capillaries and third the pressure on the venous side because of this and as you move from the arterial to venous side the net hydrostatic pressure gradient decreases this is in a way a safety factor because if more fluid is filtered out because of high p capillary pressure your interstitial pressure will rise and your p capillary pressure will fall dramatically therefore reducing the gradient and therefore reducing the amount of fluid that leaks out Pre-capillary sphincter is really important in maintaining the pre-capillary pressure via autoregulation. So if you have got high blood pressure, your pre-capillary sphincter will constrict, thereby maintaining the capillary pressures. In cases of local inflammation, your pre-capillary sphincter loses its autoregulation capacity. So that would result in your increased capillary pressures. Inflammation also causes your membranes to become more leaky, therefore increasing the amount of fluid that is filtered out of the capillaries. Oncotic pressure on the other hand increases along the capillary as you move from arterial to venous side. And this happens because proteins do not cross this membrane easily. So your concentration of protein increases as you move from arterial to venous side, therefore increasing plasma oncotic pressure. So the amount of fluid that returns in because of the oncotic pressure difference increases as you move from arterial to venous side. And this again acts as a safety factor because if more fluid is filtered, you got much higher plasma oncotic pressure. Therefore, more fluid is returned back to the capillaries. Oncotic pressure is the osmotic pressure created by the proteins. 
And of these, there are three in the plasma, albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen. Albumin is the smallest molecule and is present in the highest concentration. So it contributes highest to your total plasma oncotic pressure, which is about 28. Out of 28, 9 millimeters of mercury is from an effect called Gibbs donor effect. And this happens because of charges on these protein molecules. And we'll talk about this effect in a different lecture. So overall fluid movement through the capillaries depends upon the difference in this hydrostatic and oncotic pressure at every point on the capillary bed. So as you move from arterial to venous side, you can see that your oncotic pressure gradient increases while your hydrostatic pressure decreases. So your net flow is highest up on the arterial side and least on the venous side. So by the end of the capillaries, there might be some net inward movement. However, there are few problems with this model. The first, the amount of lymph that is produced is much lower than what your Starling equation predicts. So the black lines shows the amount of fluid that should be filtered as per Starling principle, while the red line is what is really observed. Other thing is nobody has ever found fluid returning into the venous side of the capillaries, except in kidneys where filtration rate is very high. So we have revised the Starling model and the new model is your pore exit microgradient and glycocalyx cleft model. This is also called revised Starling model. This looks a bit complicated, but the four main features of this model is first, instead of plasma and interstitium, there is a glycocalyx layer between these. This constitutes small pore system and it is highly impermeable to proteins. So below this glycocalyx lies subglycocalyx space, which is very low in protein, therefore has very low oncotic pressure. So the oncotic pressure gradient is not the plasma oncotic pressure minus the interstitial oncotic pressure, it is in fact plasma oncotic pressure minus oncotic pressure in the subglycocalyx space. The second feature of this model is the proteins are not filtered, but they are carried across these cells of the capillaries. And this constitute your large pore system for transport of the proteins across the cells. And in fact, what you have is a gradient of oncotic pressures rather than one fixed oncotic pressure and this oncotic pressure changes as you move away from the capillaries. The oncotic pressure between the interstitium and subglycocalyx space is countered by the fast flow of filtrate because of hydrostatic pressure gradient. And therefore, the oncotic pressure gradient remains almost constant and is only the difference between the plasma oncotic pressure and the subglycocalyx space. We'll talk about how this loss of glycocalyx changes when you talk about this model in detail. For example, in patient with sepsis, all the fluid and protein that have filtered out of the capillaries are removed by lymphatics. So your body makes around 8 liters of filtrate every day and half of this is absorbed in the microvessels in the lymphatics. So your total lymph flow back to the circulatory system is around 4 liters per day. You can see that you make around 4 ml per minute of filtrate in your whole body while your kidneys, the filtration rate is around 125 ml per minute. The lymphatic flow towards the heart is both active and passive. The basic unit of lymphatics is a structure called lymphangion. It is covered by smooth muscles and has its own pressure volume curve. There are valves in the lymphatics that prevent the backflow of lymph. This system pumps around two thirds of all lymph that is received by the circulatory system. The skeletal muscle, respiratory movements and peristalsis in the gut account for rest one third of the lymph that is returned to the circulatory system. The lymphangion can contract and generate a very high pressure ranging from 20 to 120 millimeters of mercury in an upright position. Remember that it takes around 90 millimeters of mercury pressure to send the filtered plasma from foot back to the venous system when you are in standing position. As more fluid gets filtered out of the capillaries, your interstitial pressure rises and this results in increased lymphatic flow. As your P interstitium rises and crosses one, your lymphatic flow increases dramatically. However, it peaks at around 10 to 20 times of normal flow. And this happens because your lymphatic pumps can pump so much and lymphatics can dilate so much. And as they dilate, the valves become more incompetent and therefore your lymphatic flow does not increase beyond a certain point. So when you see edema, think about four factors. First is, is there any increase in hydrostatic gradient? And for this, you are thinking about, is my mean peak capillary pressure high? And this happens mostly because of 
problem with venous side. So think about if you have systemic venous hypertension as seen in congestive heart failure or regional venous hypertension as seen in chronic venous insufficiency. If you have increased plasma volume, you will have increased mean peak capillary pressure and it is seen in cirrhosis, heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, fluid overload, etc. You can see decreased p interstitium in inflammatory conditions. Next, think about a decreased oncotic pressure gradient and this comes from decreased plasma oncotic pressures which is seen in cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome and malnutrition. Think about increased permeability as seen in cellulitis and inflammation. And finally, think about if you have lymphatic issues, if there are incompetent valves or obstruction. Once you have thought about these four pathophysiological mechanisms, you should be able to get a fair idea where the problem lies. These are the references. The links are in description below.